Well, thank you uh, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me back. I just can't tell you how honored and pleased I am every year uh, when EDA comes around and it's time to uh, head up to the mountains. Usually can't in Anaskas, but this year, oh, wonderful to be here in Banff with you. It's almost like, I say this every year, I know, but it, it's a bit of a, a, a reunion, a bit of a homecoming, and I know a lot of you feel the same way, the EDA conference, uh, a real highlight for so many people. So thank you uh, to Leanne and to uh, EDA for inviting me back. The title of my presentation this morning, Rebuilding Alberta's Economy, an Economic Outlook for the Winter and Now in the Spring of 2017. Probably a lot of you will remember the presentation, or at least the tone of the presentation a year ago. Very, very different outlook uh, than what we're looking at now in 2017. And I think as, as Albertans look back on the recession, this is the way a lot of them might feel <laughs> it's treated them, feeling like it has collapsed in on top of themselves. Despite the fact that if you go back three years ago, to right around this time of year, uh, June, April, May, June of 2014, you know, this, it looked like there was no end in sight for Alberta's growth. Energy prices were strong. Alberta was the, was the leader of Canada's economy, the engine of, of job creation. And it did not look like this was ever going to stop. However, we did not really see what was coming in 2015 and 2016, and that is two years of nasty recession. Now, it isn't unusual, in fact, to see a recession in Alberta, and those of you who have been around Alberta long enough know that this is what we go through. Usually about every six or seven years, not always spaced out evenly, but about every six or seven years, Alberta does see a contraction. So it's not unusual to see recession. What is unusual, though, is two consecutive years of recession. And that is what we've just come through. To find something as bad, you do need to go back to the mid-1980s. But for a lot of Albertans who weren't here in the, in the mid-80s, or maybe weren't even alive in the mid-80s, the recession we've just come through, this will be the new kind of generational recession. This will be the one that people will talk about for many, many years, and they'll compare it. You know, probably 30 years from now, people will say, is this as bad as 15, 16? You know, this will become the new sort of gold standard that people will remember and talk about when they talk about nasty recessions. Sometimes you can see things coming. Maybe back in 2014, we could have foresaw a little bit what was happening. Sometimes you can see a bad idea in progress, like this guy here. This looks like a really bad idea. <laughs> now, I am not a kinesiologist. This is not my area of expertise, but I wouldn't recommend this. This is going to end badly for this guy and the guy standing behind him, I think. Uh, and when it does, I hope he has the chance to go back and review a few things and maybe tweak a few things differently. And if we had the luxury of going back to 2014, knowing what was ahead of us, I think it's fair to say a lot of individuals, maybe businesses, maybe towns and communities, maybe they would have done a few things differently in advance. But sometimes we can't anticipate what's going to happen. Like the forest fires in Fort McMurray last May. <coughs> totally unpredictable, no way to foresee that kind of event, but obviously it having a devastating impact on not just the community of Wood Buffalo, but in fact felt throughout the province. What I want to talk about this morning is where we're at now in our provincial economy. So there's five aspects or components, I guess, of Alberta's economy I want to discuss. Talk about where we were at two or three years ago, where we're at today, and then offer some of my thoughts and uh, suggestions as where I think things are going in 2017 and beyond. <clears throat> all right, let's start first of all with employment. It's always around the job market. This is where people become very emotionally affected by a recession. I always joke, no one lies awake at night tossing and turning, worrying about the wholesale trade report or manufacturing shipments or the kinds of things that I would track every month as an economist. But they will lie awake at night if they're worried about their job. Are they going to have a job tomorrow? Are they going to be able to find a job? Are their kids coming out of school, out of university and college? Will they find work or will they have to move provinces? So there's no question when you talk about the economy, the single most emotional piece of it is always around the job market. What I've done is I've created an infographic to describe or to compare where Alberta's job market was about three years ago and where we're at today. So over the, the breadth of the recession. I started with the period 2013-2014, sort of a 12-month average period spanning the 2013-14 leading up to where oil prices started to dip. 
This really represents the high water mark. This for Alberta was as good as it got just before the recession started to take hold. Record high level of people working, record high average weekly earnings. So we're going to start at this point. What I've done, for every sector of the economy, I've created a colored box. The width of the box is going to represent average weekly earnings in that sector. So the wider the box, the bigger the paychecks. The height of the box is going to represent the number of people employed in that sector. So you see kind of what I'm doing with this. It's the area of the box, not one or the other, but it's, it's the size of the box that really matters in terms of its contribution to the provincial economy. And then I'm going to stack the boxes up in decreasing order of wages, so we're going to end up with a, a bit of a jobs pyramid. So we're going to start at the very bottom. Any guesses what sector is home to the very highest earnings in Alberta and indeed the country? Probably the world, oil and gas. No question, it's not even close. This will make more sense when I stack up the boxes. But you see that oil and gas uh, sector, average weekly earnings in Alberta's petroleum sector more than double the Canadian average. So you see that box is very broad, very wide, but it's actually not all that deep. Direct employment in oil and gas, it is not one of the larger sectors, in fact, in Alberta. We'll see uh, many sectors that have far more employee employees, but because it is so wide, obviously that box is a significant contributor to the economy. Number two, construction. So you see wages have fallen considerably, but they are still in second place. But that box is almost twice as deep as oil and gas, meaning that the construction sector is actually a larger contributor to Alberta's overall economy than in fact direct employment in oil and gas. Of course, all these things are related. A lot of the construction sector is driven by the petroleum sector. On top of that, professional, scientific, and technical occupations. So these would be things like accountants and lawyers, geologists, engineers. Again, a lot of it related to the energy sector. Uh, but if you have a professional designation behind your name, you'd be in this category here. Wholesale trade, public administration, manufacturing. So you can start to see how wages are, are falling. Transportation and warehousing, education, health care retail, and at the very top, accommodation and food. And at the very bottom, there's about 11 other categories that I've lumped together in an all other category just to keep the graph a little cleaner. So there you have the employment tree, what it looked like about three years ago. Now here's what it looks like today. Your first reaction might be disappointment because you thought, oh, I thought it was gonna look totally different. Fundamentally, the two don't look all that different. But there are four important differences. Four sectors, or four of these colored boxes, have been responsible for virtually all of the jobs lost in Alberta over the last three years. What are those four sectors? Well, you might start to eyeball it, and you might be figuring this out. The number one sector in terms of jobs lost, oil and gas, down 23% in total employment compared to three years ago. So you notice that box in 2013-2014, in compared to today, it's a lot shallower, is that a word? It's a lot more shallow. But it's just as broad. In fact, wages in oil and gas are even a little bit higher, average wages, than they were three years ago. The way Alberta's petroleum sector has managed to get their costs down is not to you know, shrink wages or bonuses, but it's actually to eliminate headcount. And they've done that uh, quite aggressively, 23% drop in employment. Number two in terms of jobs lost, construction sector down 11%. Number three, professional, scientific, and technical, down 9%. You can start to see a trend developing here. And the fourth sector that has uh, saw sig significant job loss, manufacturing, down about 12%. Those four sectors have been responsible for all the lost jobs. Now, looking at that, you don't need to have a Nobel Prize in economics to understand the problem here in Alberta. Disproportionately, the jobs that have been lost have been high-paying jobs. And that has really made this recession a lot more severe. When you look at the 2009 recession, which, by the way, was a very deep but very short recession. A lot of people forgot we even had a recession in 2009, but we did. But at that point, that recession was entirely different. That was triggered by a global financial market meltdown and credit market crisis. And, but the jobs lost in Alberta in 2009 were much more uniformly spread across that jobs pyramid. This recession, they're concentrated in the energy sector, 
and a lot of those high income sectors related to oil and gas. So when you look at the height of the overall tree, which is what a lot of people want to do, is say, well, how many jobs have been lost? Yeah, that tree is shorter. It's down by about 3.7%. Total employment is down 3.7%, about. But that really isn't the most significant number here. The bigger number, or the, the bigger descriptor, I guess, is not the height of the tree, but the area of the tree. It's employment multiplied by the wages earned in those respective sectors. And there you see total wages in the province are down almost 6%. This, I think, demonstrates or maybe describes a bit better the problem that Alberta has seen over the downturn. It's not just that we've lost jobs, we've lost high paying jobs. It's also the reason why Calgary has been hit by this downturn much more than Edmonton. Edmonton having a more diversified labor market, a few more, proportionately, a few more jobs in, in healthcare, education, retail, if you count West Edmonton Mall, I guess. Uh, but Calgary, of course, more concentrated in the oil and gas sector and some of those professional occupations. I'm going to save a few of my comments for where the job market is going next for the end of the presentation. But for now, I hope this gives a nice visual description of how Alberta's job market has changed over the last three years. Okay, let's talk about the petroleum sector particularly because as I always say and as we, everyone knows, if you've been in this province for more than 15 minutes, you know that the petroleum sector, that's the dog that wags an awful lot of tails, directly and indirectly. Directly, I mean, we saw that, that dark red box, but more so indirectly. You have to look pretty hard in this province to find somebody who is in no way affected by the price of West Texas Intermediate. A friend of mine, uh, this was a few years ago, she's a school teacher up in Edmonton, and she kind of made the offhanded comment. She said, oh, I'm glad I don't work in oil and gas. And I thought, if you as a publicly paid employee don't think you work for the petroleum sector or you're not affected by it, uh, you need to go back and review how public finance operates in this province because absolutely public administration and people who work in the public sector uh, are affected by what happens with the price of oil. So there's not very many people who are unaffected. And we've seen over the last three years, this has been the single economic change, in fact, in Alberta. Nothing else economically actually has changed for the worse. In fact, many things uh, like the low Canadian dollar have actually been you know, helpful. But the single economic factor that has changed has been the drop in the price of oil. From about $107 a barrel about three years ago now, landing with a thud around $28 a barrel a little more than one year ago, and now with some modest recovery. Well, where are oil prices going next? That's what's top of mind for everybody. The first thing we need to recognize is that anything could happen. We can't say never to any scenario. We can't say this will never happen or that will never happen or he could never be elected president of the United States. Like, we have to stop using that never word because once you start saying never, you really start to limit your scope of potential scenarios or outcomes and then you could find yourself in trouble. So we have to recognize a year from now oil could be at 25 and here I'm using the U.S. benchmark price, that West Texas Intermediate. Could be at $25 a barrel. It could be at 95 I don't think those are very likely scenarios. Instead, I'm kind of with a consensus of, of a lot of uh, observers in this. Uh, our, our forecast is calling for oil to trade within the $50 to $60 U.S. price range for 2017. Now, currently, we are below that. And if it stays below too long or if it starts to spiral down to you know, 40 uh, you know, I'm open to revising that forecast, but I actually don't think it will. I actually don't think it's going to dip. I mean, if it gets into the $40 range, we don't know. But I think actually OPEC was a little happier to see prices uh, a little bit higher, especially Saudi Arabia. I think they realized that this game of chicken they were playing, you know, a, a year ago, just pushing as much oil onto the market as they could, trying to weed out competitors by keeping price low. It was a very effective strategy for a while. The problem is it was crushing Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC countries as well. If you think our provincial government is dependent on oil revenues, uh, it's far more for Saudi Arabia and a lot of those other countries, which were going bankrupt at an alarming rate. So I think they were happier to see prices shored up a little bit. If the agreements that they put together just before Christmas, I mean, now it looks like there's some reneging on those uh, production outputs. Uh, if it holds together or not, we'll have to see. But I think that there will be some discipline 
among the OPEC uh, producers, at least to keep prices from falling back down to you know, 30 or, or, or 25. So I think we'll see some stability uh, above 40 and probably in that 50 to 60 range. On the upside, though, there's not a lot of possibility, in my estimation, of oil prices getting above 60, not on a sustained basis. I mean, they could pop above 60. But the problem is now not OPEC isn't the factor. The, the factor now is the U.S. shale production. There is a lot of shale oil in the United States, and it comes on the market very quickly and very easily. I shouldn't say the word easily, but, you know, that oil gets drawn into production. Right when oil prices hit about 50 55 certainly $60 would, would trigger a lot of supply production. So I don't see a lot of potential for it uh, rising too much above that. Instead, I think 50 to 60 is the range we're looking at. For Alberta, that's good news and bad news. The good news is $55 oil is much better than $28 oil. It's precisely twice as good, in fact, as $28 oil. And that has really gone a long way to stabilize Alberta's petroleum sector. So the challenging news going forward, though, is $50, $55 oil, it puts the petroleum industry in Alberta in a different role. The role that it takes on now is as a stable backbone of our economy, but not really a growth engine, not in the same way that it was between 2010 and 2014, when in fact petroleum was fueling a lot of employment, a lot of capital spending, a lot of investment, a lot of foreign capital coming in. It was really creating a lot of growth. It was the growth engine. Now, going forward, it doesn't play that role, not in the same way, not with oil at $50 or $55 a barrel, but it does remain a stable backbone of our economy. All right, let's uh, move on and talk about construction. <clears throat> Here, there is a lot of anxiety, especially if you happen to be in downtown Calgary, about have we built far too much, and now what? Is the construction sector really going to hit the skids in 2017 because we've got this big overhang of commercial real estate? And it's not limited to downtown Calgary. Across the province, there's been a lot of uh, construction and some anxiety about, you know, what happens now? Are we going to see a big pullback? Well, for economists, the best indicator that we have of where construction spending is going in the coming 12 months is a report every month that Stats Canada puts out on building permits. And you people understand this as well as anyone. If you're a home builder or you're a commercial real estate developer, anyone who wants to build a project, one of the first things you need to do is secure your permits with the city or the town council. So building permits at the moment, so this is province-wide, we're down 26% from where we were two years ago. That is a big drop, and it's not a made-up statistic. This isn't an alternative fact. It's real. Compared to two years ago, down more than a quarter. Now, that is the kind of statistic that one of my dear friends in the media would probably like to write a story about because it's a bit alarming. And it would kind of keep people, you know, it's, it's a bit of a compelling story. But I would suggest it's not the best comparison. It is a true comparison, but it's not the most accurate. Comparing where we're at today to two years ago, the record peak year of all time in Alberta, uh, I don't think that's the most appropriate benchmark. Instead, I think the more appropriate benchmark is where are we today compared to the 10-year average? Because between 2006 and 2016, as I said, this province, we've seen two major recessions, and we've seen a lot of boom years in between those recessions. We've been up and down the business cycle a few times in the last decade. And I think that 10-year period is a good comparison. Right now, building permits are down from the 10-year average, but we're down 4%. Well, that is not, that's not as interesting a media article, is it? Because it kinda, it's kind of boring. It sort of suggests 2017 is going to be soft, but really not that unusual, not compared to where we've been over the last decade. So that's what I would describe. Uh, oh, I've got to put my Tonka toys up there. I would describe the construction sector this year as a slowdown, but not a catastrophe, not a disaster. We will see a much bigger pullback in construction spending in Calgary. There's no question about that, because that is where all, a lot of that commercial office space has been concentrated. But uh, as Minister Billis was talking, uh, saying yesterday, you know, the provincial and federal governments, they're, they're keeping up with their infrastructure spending. And I know reasonable people can sort of argue or disagree, but the reality is that some of that infrastructure spending is going to be coming in 2017. That will provide a nice partial offset to the pullback that we're going to see in the commercial space. It won't 
entirely offset it. Um, and Calgary, as I said, will be hit harder. But province-wide, we're looking at a slow year, but not a disaster. All right, let's talk about some, uh, maybe some more upbeat news, some of the non-energy sectors that I think are poised to do very well <coughs> in 2017 and beyond. So the first one is tourism. So we're going to pull out the Barbie sport camper, and I know a lot of you had that sport camper, or your sister did and you played with it, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, use, we'll use the Barbie sport camper, Barbie and Ken there, uh, to talk about tourism. Now, a lot of you in, in the different uh, towns and communities and cities you're, you're in uh, will know this. 2015 was a record-setting year for tourism. 2016 was a record on top of that. And 2017, all indications are pointing towards a third consecutive year of, of record-setting year for tourism. What is it that's fueling all this tourism? Well, there's a, few, a lot of factors that are aligning just in the right way. The U.S. economy is really back on its feet. They've got 4.8% unemployment. Wages are growing very strongly. In fact, the U.S. Federal Reserve is the only central bank in the world at the moment that is now actively tightening their monetary policy. They're raising interest rates, and they're doing this in a very measured, very predictable way. There's going to be two more rate increases this year, and we've just seen two, December and, and now March. So the U.S. economy is back on its feet. That, I think, will uh, encourage more U.S. visitors to Canada. The Canadian dollar, still relatively weak, probably not going anywhere real quick, probably not appreciating anyway. In that 74 to 76 cent range, um, that will encourage, again, more U.S. spending. It will also encourage more Canadians to stay closer to home for their vacations. We have Alberta's much better trade or uh, transportation connections now with Asia, particularly China. China, I think, still represents the largest, mostly untapped market for tourism potential for Canada and for Alberta. We've got Canada's sesquicentennial this year, parties and events and parades all over the place. The national parks are free. And by the way, not everything in the parks are free this year. It's just your gate admission. So don't go to uh, the Bam Springs Hotel and uh, at checkout say, well, Justin Trudeau said everything's free. Uh, it isn't. <laughs> but you, you get the point. The parks are free. A lot of things working in tourism's favor. Now, we have to recognize that tourism as a sector, it is dwarfed by the petroleum industry. And I don't want to be accused of you know, making it sound like these two things are equal. We shouldn't even be talking about tourism and oil and gas in the same sentence, really, because they are so vastly different in size. But what I love about the tourism industry is that it's one of the very few industries in the province that you could actually say, you know, it actually operates better if oil prices are low. It, it runs a bit counter to it. When oil prices are low, that tends to keep the Canadian dollar a little softer, tends to keep transportation and fuel costs down a little bit. And it does represent, in a, in a true sense, some, some economic diversity as a base industry. So I'm optimistic about tourism. The other one that I'm optimistic about is agriculture and agri-foods. So we'll pull out the Fisher Price Family Farm to talk about agriculture. Now, I always have to be very careful when I, and I spend a lot of my time <clears throat> with uh, ATB traveling around rural Alberta. When I'm talking to farm groups, I cannot sound too optimistic about agriculture. They don't like that, you know, if I say I'm really optimistic. They're going to haul me out in the parking lot and tell me just how miserable it is in, in farming. <laughs> you know, and I don't say that lightly because uh, I'm, I'm not from a farm family, but I'm one short generation removed and have spent my entire life in, in Alberta and a lot of it in rural Alberta. And I know farming, this is not for the timid of spirit at all. And I don't say that as a joke. It's always something going wrong in, in farming. The tenacity of farmers, I mean, I'm just in awe of any of them that they can do this at all. But they manage to do it. The big three, uh, in terms of farm cash receipts, the big three, cattle, wheat, canola, they account for about 80% of Alberta's farm cash receipts. I think they'll do OK kind of in the long run. I mean, at any one given point, there's something going on the bovine tuberculosis this winter being one of them. Um, we'll have to see how Mother Nature cooperates with, uh, with the uh, wheat and canola farmers. But where I'm more optimistic about growth potential is not necessarily in the traditional, uh, the big three, but it's more in the agri-food space. Food and beverage processing in Alberta has very quietly but steadily increased now to a $14 billion industry. And just for some perspective on that, it has now surpassed refined petroleum products in terms of the value of production. Now, refined petroleum, when you look at our manufacturing space in Alberta, refined petroleum was always number one. It has now dipped to number two. 
largely because prices have dipped. You know, and if refined petroleum prices come back, it could regain number one spot. But uh, very steadily, food and beverage manufacturing has now taken over number one spot. A lot of that is meat packing in the meat processors down in southern Alberta. But where the real growth has been hasn't been in meat processing. It's been in all of the other small and medium size uh, agri-food production. A lot of it at sort of the cottage level industry. And yeah, one jar of organic honey does not replace a barrel of oil in this province, but 10,000 or so new food processors around the province. Well, this is now where we start to see things balancing out at least a little bit more in terms of diversity. And that's really positive. Now, what has changed? What's been leading to all this food and beverage production over the last decade or so? Because this isn't new. I mean, if, if a lot of you, if you were around in economic development back in the 80s, you know, for decades, we've been trying to get food processing going in Alberta to try to add more value to our agricultural commodities. And there were always these plans, let's get a pasta factory going and all these different things, but they always kind of fell flat. They never really took off in a big way. And that's because in the 80s, we could not, our food processors in Alberta, could not compete against the economies of scale that the giant processors in places like Mississauga, so this is the General Mills and the Kraft Canada's, and we couldn't compete in that space in terms of the economies of scale. It just wasn't even close. So they always really struggled in the 80s. Fast forward to 2017, and our small food processors still cannot match the economies of scale of the, food, of the giant food processors. What has changed over that last 30 years is a real shift in consumer tastes and preferences around local. And this, I don't believe, is a, a fad. I think this is an entrenched, longer-term co uh, consumer trend. Now, when you say that, you know, this is locally distilled gin, or this is local, you know, cheese, or hothouse tomatoes, and it's all local, restaurants are falling all over themselves trying to promote our local use of, and consumers love it. <clears throat> consumers will pay a premium for that, because local now has cachet, and it really didn't 30 years ago. And again, a lot of you might agree, 30 years ago, if someone said, try this local you know, craft brewery, I would say, well, it couldn't be any good if it's local. I mean, and that was wrong-headed of us, but it, in the 80s and 90s, local didn't come with any, any premium. In fact, it was always kind of seen as inferior. Now, for a lot of different reasons, but consumers want to engage with their food and beverage in a different way. And they love the, the fact that it's local, and they'll pay for that. So that's what's really given the advantage or some of the momentum for our small food, and not all of them small, by the way, but largely small and, and medium-sized food and beverage processors, and I think 2017 and beyond, a lot of scope for growth. And then we could even get into, why don't we have a free trade agreement with Japan now and start sending them a lot of this, um, uh, our, our manufactured food and beverages. Uh, a huge market, and I don't want to get off on this, huge market, an untapped market in Japan for Alberta honey. I think honey should become what to Alberta what maple syrup is to Quebec. I think there's enormous possibilities, but that's a different presentation. Okay, I gotta keep moving on. What, finally, what are some of the wild cards that could affect Alberta's economy? Wild cards that we can't control, maybe from outside of our own borders. Well, we're gonna dip back into the toy box one more time. These are the Avengers action figures. But instead of Captain America and Thor and the others, we've got a whole new cast and crew <laughs> of very compelling geopolitical characters in 2017. And what all of this means for politics and, and the economy, the global economy, I mean, I can't imagine a more compelling year to watch than, than 2017 already. I mean, just the dynamics we've been watching. Top of mind for Canadians, of course, of this group anyway, is President Trump. We just don't know what to make of this. Uh, and again, you know, you, you can never say never. A lot of people a year ago, a lot of people maybe four months ago, did not think that we would be sitting here talking about the future of NAFTA. You know, the, the, the largest inter-country trade agreement the world has ever seen, one that has tremendously benefited the Canadian economy. You really couldn't find a sensible economist at all, or even politician in Canada, that would say NAFTA's been a bad deal. Now, they're talking about tearing it up. How did all this happen? Well, of course, President Trump brings with him a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, uh, you know, what's he going to tweet out next? And how do we make some, some plans or some forecast around this? 
And I think there was a big uh, collective sigh of relief that went up in Canada the, the day after, maybe about a month ago, three weeks, uh, after Prime Minister Trudeau met with uh, President Trump and they had that meeting and Justin charmed the pants off of him, it seemed. And the message that came out of that seemed to be, Canada, don't freak out about this too much. It's not you, it's Mexico, really, that we're, you know. And the messages from Donald Trump and, and the White House, the administration, I think, have been, we view Canada as a fair trading partner, where they don't see China and Mexico and maybe some others, they don't see them in the same way as being sort of a level playing trading partner, and they do with Canada. <clears throat> so I think that there was some anxiety that was lifted after that. And nonetheless, I mean, we are still in, in uncharted water here with this new administration in terms of what precisely this means for Canada. Will we see a border adjustment tax sort of indiscriminate against all foreign goods coming in? Where does that leave Canadian energy? Where does that leave Canadian agriculture, forestry? A lot of anxiety in the forestry sector around the softwood lumber agreement that needs to be renegotiated this year. Uh, always tough negotiating with the Americans in any year, and, and it should be. I mean, they're good negotiators. They want to get the best deal as well. But now, with the, the Trump administration kind of in their back pocket, I think those negotiations are going to be even more difficult. So even though I think Canada, we don't need to, to fear the worst case scenario, I don't think that uh, we're, we're, you know, it would be naive to think we're going to get off entirely scot-free on this as well. The other uh, geopolitical characters, Angela Merkel, she's going to have her hands full in Europe this year. Last year, we saw the Brexit vote, whereby the citizens of the United Kingdom voted themselves out of the European Union. This year, we don't have any referendums on exiting, but we do have major elections coming up in countries like France, Italy, and Germany. These are really, other than the UK, these are the big three nation economies of the European Union. And in all of them, there is a strong nationalist populist movement, a Eurosceptic movement. What is that? I thought it was like some, my time's up. No, I'm okay. <coughs> I, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm on page two. What did Minister Billis say? I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so we've got a lot of these strong populist movements growing in Europe. I don't know. I'm not a geopolitical expert. I can't make any predictions other than to say Europe a year from now could look very different than it does today. And if there's one thing financial markets and commodity markets and everything else that they don't like so much, it's when the fibers or the, the, the political and economic fabric of the European Union looks to be at stake here. So we could see some financial market volatility. We could see commodity or currency market volatility. And then you see how that kind of washes up on the shores here in Canada and in Alberta. Uh, Russia, China, absolutely fascinating dynamics to watch this year. You throw Donald Trump into the mix. You've got North Korea firing off missiles. I don't know. I mean, a, an optimist would say this is going to be fascinating to watch. The pessimist would say this is terrifying. Uh, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, I think. But Canada, Alberta, we do have something at stake in uh, global geopolitics this year. Okay, finally, to wrap up, I want to end on a story that I think offers a compelling lesson for Alberta. The story starts in the 1920s in Cincinnati, Ohio. At the time, an entrepreneur and inventor by the name of Noah McVicker. He identified a problem that a lot of American homes were having. And that is, homes in the 20s and 30s, wallpaper was a popular way to decorate. The problem is, the wall, it was before they had vinyl wallpaper, the wallpaper was actually paper, and it got very dirty. A lot of homes were still on coal furnaces, and they were using oil lamps and lanterns, and as a result, the wallpaper was a mess. Noah McVicker, however, he identified this problem, and he came up with an innovative product. He mixed boric acid, mineral oil, water, salt, and flour. And he came up with a product that you could, a substance, you could press it against the wall and peel it off, and it would clean the wallpaper. And it was a hit. Consumers loved it. Through the 20s and 30s, his family-run soap company enjoyed huge commercial success selling this product. But kind of like a lot of stories where it looks like there's no end in sight of, of the good times, suddenly everything ended for Noah McVicker by the 1940s, and that was because after the war, homes were converting to natural gas, and electricity had all but replaced the oil lamps and lanterns. And as a result, the wallpaper was staying nice and clean. 
And as a result of that, no one was buying his wallpaper cleaning product anymore. And his family-run soap company was almost bankrupt because of lack of demand. Well, fortunately for Noah McVicker, he brought alongside on his company his younger nephew, Joseph McVicker. And Joseph McVicker had that ability to step back from the problem and view it in a different way, with a different perspective. And that made all the difference. He said to his uncle, you know, uncle, this wallpaper cleaning product you've developed, it does more than just clean wallpaper. It has other uses. The students at the art school are using it as a modeling clay, and children love playing with it. And that was the beginning of Plato. Who knew that one of the best loved and best selling toys of all times actually started out as a failed product? A product that no one had any use for anymore in its original purpose because that purpose had kind of gone away. But in fact, it was, they were able to reinvent this as something totally different. So for Alberta, what does this mean? Well, I love this story for a lot of reasons, not least of all because who doesn't love Plato? <laughs> Unless you're trying to clean it out of the rug, which parents tell me is really <laughs> difficult to do. But everyone loves Plato. But I think the lesson of the story for Alberta in 2017, we might think of this, this is maybe our Plato year a little bit. This is a year after we've kind of caught our breath from the recession. A lot of businesses, a lot of towns and communities, a lot of individuals might need to step back and view the problem in a different perspective and say, well, we are a hydrocarbon producing province. That doesn't change. That remains a core of our economy. But now we need to think we need to add on to that. In addition to our hydrocarbon industry, what else do we do in this province? What other new uses and purposes do we have? Maybe industries that we don't even have names for yet because they don't exist. I don't think Noah McVicker probably would have, you know, back in the 20s, I don't think he would have uh, ever foresaw him being the father of one of the best toys of all times. But in the same respect, you know, Alberta, we become very focused on, on one industry. We need to now expand our scope and perspective to not replace the energy sector, but to add on to that new industries. So just to summarize and wrap up, we think oil prices are going to remain mostly stable between 50 and 60. Uh, we think we'll probably see those prices drift a little bit higher from where they're at currently. That stabilizes the petroleum industry, stabilizes the economy, but it doesn't yet bring back a lot of tremendous growth to the energy sector. The construction sector is going to slow down, especially in Calgary, but that is what I would call it, a slowdown, not a disaster or a collapse. The job market is going to remain weak, and here's where I've saved a few of my comments for the end of the presentation about jobs. As an economist, anytime I track uh, labor market indicators and business cycles, the labor market is notorious, or it's very predictable, for lagging the business cycles. So this recession was no different. Coming into the recession in 2014 and 2015, when oil prices started to slide one way down, the job market in Alberta didn't res respond for about eight or nine months, and that's a predictable pattern. But once it did start to respond, yeah, the unemployment rate went from four and a half to nine and a half percent. Now that we're coming out of the recession, I think the labor market is also going to lag. In other words, even though we see conditions starting to improve almost consistently across the province when I'm in towns and communities and I talk to businesses, they're saying, yep, things have turned a corner. But I think businesses are going to be reluctant to pile back on a lot of people right away. A lot of them are going to have balance sheets they're going to need to sort of clean up and repair. And a lot of them, I think, are going to want to see a few more quarters of compelling economic growth, certainty, before they start bringing back on a lot of people. So as a result, I think the first half of the year, sort of we're square in the middle of that right now, the first half of 17, I think we can expect that unemployment rate to remain a bit elevated a bit of a challenge for job seekers. And that is going to be tough, you know, because you listen to the economists like me on the news saying, yeah, things are turning around, but for a lot of job seekers, it's not going to feel like it is turning around yet. Second half of 2017, probably more hiring and, and probably more yet into 2018, but I think it's going to lag a little bit. So for the first half of the year, we're expecting the job market to still remain kind of a challenge. The global wild cards, Donald Trump and the others we've talked about, fascinating to watch this year. The non-energy sectors, tourism, agriculture, and particularly agri-foods, I think a lot of potential for growth there. And at the moment, our forecast at ATB Financial and our economics team, we're calling for 2.2% growth this year. 
Now, I learned from Minister Billis last night that we're actually one of the more conservative ones uh, with the conference board at 2.8. But generally speaking, all the forecasters, including ours, we're, we're basically saying that 2017 is going to be a bit of a rebound year for Alberta. After two years of contraction, and over those two years, our provincial economy has shrunk by about 6 or 7 percent. We're not sure about the 2016 numbers yet. But it's sort of like six steps backward, and now this year, two or maybe two and a half steps forward. So that's good. It does end two years of contraction, but two or two and a half percent growth will still feel very modest in a province that had become quite accustomed to four or five percent growth between 2010 and 2014. So with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, you guys know about the OWL. This is our daily newsletter we write every morning. We call it the owl, of course, because the great horned owl is our provincial bird. I've been through this every year with you folks, so you don't need to know about it or know any more about it. You can sign up for free, atb.com slash economics, and uh, you can receive that each day. And then I want to make a quick little comment about my brand new book. So in the introduction, it was mentioned about the, the previous two books. This is a new book. Uh, my co-author, Robert Roach, also from ATB, we're launching this uh, at the end of April. Now, my communications director, she says, don't say anything about the book until we launch the book. I said, I promise I won't say anything about the book. <laughs> but I really can't help it because I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. So the new book is called Spiders in Space, Successfully Adapting to Unwanted Change. And I don't know if some of you have seen me present in the past, you might have heard me use the spider's metaphor. Uh, but the spiders in space name, it draws from the experiments NASA did with spiders in zero gravity. They wanted to observe just what will spiders do when they don't have gravity, especially around building web. Will they even attempt to build a web in zero gravity? Because on Earth, the essential ingredient in building a web, I guess other than the silk fibers, but they, you need gravity. The spider lowers itself down using gravity like that, and the web is built vertically, never horizontally. The vertical web, gravity kind of holds the tension in place. So you need gravity, and not once in the 100 million year history of spiders, and I did have to Google that question, how old are spiders? 100 million years, they've always had gravity, and gravity has always worked very well for them building web. Until this moment at the International Space Station, now they don't have it. What will spiders do? Well, according to the research, the spiders, their first, they did get busy right away trying to build web, and yeah, the astronauts did bring some flies up with them, but they got bu busy building their webs, but they were described as messy and disorganized. It wasn't working out for them at all. But very quickly, something astounding happened, and that is the spiders developed a totally new technique of web building. And if you think about how amazing that is, you know, the spiders, if they were humans, the very first thing they would have done is form a committee, right? <laughs> they would have said, we've got a real problem. Let's have a committee or a task force, and the task force will report back to us with a white paper. And that white paper, if the spiders were human, would say one thing. The solution is, we need these astronauts to bring us back to Earth right now, because we, we can't cope. You know, and that would have been a good outcome, actually, if the astronauts would have said, OK, spiders, we'll bring you back. That would have turned out well for the spiders. But spiders, I guess to their credit, they don't overthink these things. They don't form committees. They just get on with doing what they know how to do but in an environment that's changed on them entirely. So we love the story of it. In the book, we identify 15 Canadian, what we call successful spiders or successful adapters. Some of them are individuals, some of them are, are companies, some of them are whole economic regions, not-for-profits. Many of them are drawn from Alberta. All of them face a similar story, and that is very abruptly something happened that uh, they weren't expecting and changed their business plan or their personal plan entirely. And they had to adapt to that. And there's lots of stories of unsuccessful adapters, you know? You think of blockbuster video and a lot of them, uh, sad sack stories. Well, we wanted to focus on the positive, inspiring stories. So 15 stories, and then the second half of the book, we identify what are the common traits or characteristics of these successful adapters, and what can we as Canadians learn from them? So if you want to pick one up,